Christmas using that song and when the alabaster box was broken and the expensive ointment was spilled out. Obviously, that's what the song's about. <clears throat> and some of the disciples said, what are you doing? Actually, Judas, right? He was the wicked one. <laughs> what are you doing? That, that was expensive. You know, you could, we could have used that on something else. One of the points I made in Sunday school this morning, I was preaching a lesson on lessons from soul winning, right? I just wanted to share. Sometimes when we have one of these events, I like to just kind of share with the people there in Iola some lessons from our experience going out there and everything. And, and so, uh, so I was sharing that. And one of the last points I made is it's worth it. Like it's the most valuable thing we can do and it's worth it. And Thursday is uh, really, that was a kind of a theme with our group when we went out door knocking. Uh, this lady, after several doors, was just kind of like shutting the door, not interested, kind of getting yelled at. And then this lady just kind of flipping out on uh, Brother Justin and saying, you know, you guys are wasting your time. You're wasting your time. And, and then all of a sudden it was just a big change. Of course, we knew we weren't wasting our time, but then it was just like, thank you for being here. I'm so glad that you came. And people listening to the gospel, I don't think anybody got saved that day, but they're listening to it. You know what? It's worth it. I mean, every bit, I think about people driving and I feel sometimes as a pastor, if someone drives hour and a half, two hours to go to Iola or to come here because they want to be part of a church where they can do some more soul winning and get involved in that. And sometimes I'm like, oh, there's other churches between here and there. There's so many other churches you can be a part of. And they're like, no, I love the way you guys want to go soul winning and I want to be a part of that. And I want to go door knocking with you and see somebody get saved. And I'm thinking, well, what an expense, how much time you go back and forth and all this you're investing. But you know what? Jesus was, it was poured out for us. You know, he, I, I've heard it said before and I believe it's true. If only one person in this world would have been saved by his death on the cross, he would have done it. And so what we could do, just one, we got one shot at this life. Why not just give ourselves to the Lord? And so appreciate that song and uh, appreciate the work, the soul winning, the testimonies from yesterday and obviously many more stories uh, to come. I love the, the number, the, you see in the numbers rise with the salvation, salvations, right? Talked about this a lot yesterday. It's not about the numbers, but the numbers are a sign that we're doing something and that the gospel is being spread and that people are getting saved. And so I do like to see that number going up. All right, Titus. <clears throat> Titus, I'm, I'm sure I've preached from this text here before, but I don't remember the uh, sermon. I've probably preached a similar topic to what I'm preaching uh, this afternoon, but I'm not necessarily sure uh, when that was. But I think it's something that comes up a lot and we need to think about as Christians is uh, is being separated from the world is the is the idea. Title of the message is "In the World versus Worldly." In the world versus worldly. Uh, you're probably familiar with the phrase, especially if you're Christian, been Christian long. You hear in a in a contemporary, I mean, in a conservative church, Independent Fundamental Baptist Church. I'm sure you've heard about people that are worldly. And usually that's, I don't know, I always wonder what somebody, because I just grew up with that word, you know, worldly meant you acted like the world, and maybe you dressed like the world, and you acted like them, and you watched the things that the world uh, watches, and you did all this, and we call them worldly, and I always wondered what the average person would think about worldly, probably they would just think, you know, what do you mean, worldly, like, are we supposed to be otherworldly? Are we supposed to be like aliens, or <laughs> what, are we, what are we supposed to be, uh, you know, if not worldly, the phrase is used a lot. I was thinking about this uh, in somewhere around El Dorado Springs. Uh, when we were driving up there, we saw an uh, uh, Amish, kind of drove through an Amish community. I know Tim uh, used to live pretty close to an Amish community. Probably many of many in here have, have been in those kind of neighborhoods, and they have the buggies. Sometimes you got the sign on the side of the road, watch for buggies or whatever. And, and sure enough, there's a buggy going down the street with their family and horses. And, and I was thinking, you know, their mindset is we don't want to be worldly. We want to separate from the world, come out from among them, be separate. I'm, I don't know what all they say about that, but we want to, you know, separate ourselves from the modern conveniences of the world and everything. And, and you wonder, like, is that what it means, like, to separate from the world? Do, do we all need to go to a simplistic life where we wear simple clothes and we ride horse and buggy? And I remember one time going into a, a thrift store and this guy came in, uh, you know, he had the, the get up and the beard with no mustache and, and it was pretty obvious he was Amish. And then he came in and he asked for, a, I can't even remember what it's called now, but they couldn't have a typewriter or a computer, but there was something they could have. And I don't remember what it's called, uh, something graph, 
that was a similar idea to a type. It was like the earliest version of a typewriter or something like that. And he was like looking all, going to store to store, trying to find one of these things. And I'm like, man, a, t a computer would be a whole lot easier, wouldn't it? <laughs> but he's just, I didn't say that to him. But he was, their, their, their concept is we have to get rid of all these modern conveniences so that we're not worldly. And, uh, you know, I don't think that's necessarily what we're called to do as Christians. I personally do have a little bit of a uh, uh, inclination to kind of get away from people sometimes and go out into the wilderness, go out into the, uh, uh, with my family. I'm not trying to get away from my wife. I know what Solomon said. <laughs> Go with, to the wilderness with my family. In fact, you ever seen the wilderness family? There's, there's some movies and some books written about where this whole family like moved and they went out to the wilderness and they just decided we're just going to live with the bears and the uh, and coyotes and wolves and whatever. And they just move into the wilderness and they live in family. They, you know, they learn how to live out in in the wilderness. And and I know Brother Justin's like, hey, man, that sounds great. And <laughs> and, uh, and I, me too, man. I love that. That's appealing to me. That concept of being all alone getting away from the world and going to be in, and being isolated. But that's not what we're called to do as Christians. I don't think that's what it means uh, to not, I mean, you know, not to be worldly. <clears throat> Interestingly, there are non-believers, people that don't even believe in God or, or at least not in, you know, they don't claim to be Christians or anything, who like that lifestyle, who like going away from, you know, I remember uh, there was this craze. Uh, I don't know if they still have them or not, but all these different shows were popping up about, you know, in Alaska, these guys would go move to Alaska where there's nothing. They're just totally off the grid and they're living in the wilderness. Well, those guys weren't necessarily Christians. They just liked that that idea. And so that's, that's not what we're talking about. Uh, I've also known good Christians who I don't believe are worldly in any sense in, in the biblical way, but they... In, they take advantage of modern conveniences and they know how the things of this world work and they know even how to rub shoulders worldly people, so to speak, people of this world. And so we want to look and see what it means to be in this world uh, and at the same time not being worldly. I do believe that as Christians that we're supposed to uh, separate ourselves from this present world. And uh, if you look there at our text, verse 12 says, Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So we're in this present world, and he's saying that you want, we, but we don't want to uh, obey those things in this world that, well, let me, let me just take you to another verse. We're not supposed to uh, obey the lust of the flesh, right? Look at, uh, look at cha uh, 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Look, get a little idea of what we're talking about. Being separated and standing out from the things of this world. For, uh, 1 John... Chapter 2, look at verse 16. Or verse 15, actually. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of the Father abideth forever. So we're talking about thinking on spiritual things as opposed to those corruptible things on this earth that aren't going to last that uh, are such as the pride of life, you know, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh. These are things that are in the world that we want to avoid. You know, we can't get out of, we can't leave this world. I mean, we can go to heaven, but I'm saying while we're here, we can't leave this world. We can't go off into the wilderness or do something. You know, Jesus even prayed to the Father and said about his people, he said, I'm not praying that they go out of the world. I'm just pr praying that you'll protect them from the evil. Let's look at John chapter 17. John chapter 17, he wants to protect them from the evil that's in this world, but not that they would go out from this world and be so isolated that they don't even have an impact on the world. John 17, starting in verse 5, Jesus is praying and he says, Now, O Father, 
glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the, out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them, them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given them, unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which has, uh, thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. A little bit like a Dr. Seuss book, but <laughs> you understand what he's saying, right? He's saying, uh, he's praying, and he's, he's thanking God for giving to him, and he's saying, you know, take me back, but, you know, these are still in the world, verse 11, and now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those who thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Thou that thou, uh, uh, Those that thou givest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, talking about Judas, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them my word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, for that, uh, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So the thing is, that's going to keep a, a Christian separated from the things of this world is God's Word, which is the truth. And as we study this, we see, uh, you know, try to live according to this Word. Guess what it's going to do? It's going to separate us from those normal things that are in this world. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Those kind of things don't have a place. Look at 1 Corinthians 5. First Corinthians 5, I've made reference to this a lot. I think it's very important that Christians understand this, and it would solve a lot of problems in churches, I think, if they understood this concept. And the concept is that a church is something that is supposed to, it's, it's believers coming together and listening you know, to the preaching and being like-minded and coming together. But when there's some major sin in that church, it needs to be dealt with. Okay, and so it's expected that people that are living a certain way will be dealt with. And, uh, and, and in this case, it almost it sounds very, very rough because you're like, well, I thought you wanted people to be saved. Well, the idea is that these are saved people. These are people that would call themselves brother, uh, brethren. And it says in uh, verse 1 that there's some fornication among them that, uh, that came up. And he's saying, hey, you guys aren't taking care of that. You're not dealing with this. You're puffed up. And he says in verse 7, purge out there for that old leaven. He's, he's literally telling him to get that, that sinful person that's not going to repent, not going to change, get them out of the church. It's not that they are losing their salvation or anything like that, but it's like, hey, you're going you're gonna to bring everybody else down if we don't, uh, if we don't deal with your sin, if you don't uh, repent of that. And so verse 11, I mean, verse 10, he says, uh, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or the extortioners or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. He's saying, look, you, you, you can't just go around this world saying, hey, these, you know, this person that I work with is living in adultery or living in fornication or whatever. Like, I'm just going to quit my job. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can't, you, you, you're living in the world. People are going to act like the world. He's saying, you can't, uh, you, you're, you, 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 you're not going to go out of this world. You're going to be in this world. But verse 11, but now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, a covetous, or idolater, or a railer, nor drunkard, or extortioner, with such an one do not eat. He's saying, don't fellowship with a Christian brother who continues to back to the world because the idea is you're wanting to help them to come out of the world. We're all supposed to be helping each other, draw closer to Christ, uh, get some of that world out of us. I heard this, it's not in my notes, but I heard this illustration. You've probably heard it too, but uh, the illustration is this, like a, 
if you're in a boat, the boat is in water, right? There's water all around. And uh, as long as the water's outside the boat, you're good. But when the water is inside the boat, you take too much water inside the boat, that's when you sink, all right? And living in this world is sometimes like the water all around us and we're in the boat and it's like as long as the water doesn't get in the boat, you know, we're okay. We're in the, we're in the water, but the water's not in us. And if too much water gets in us, we're going down. And that's the idea about being separated uh, from the world. Look at uh, 2 Timothy 4. Give you a couple more verses here. 2 Timothy 4. If you're slow finding the verses, don't worry, I got tabs. I'm cheating. Otherwise, I'd, you'd be faster than me. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. And departed unto Thessalonica. And he's talking about these people that were traveling with him. They were serving him. And, he's, and he said, you know, he, Demas, he's forsaken me. He loved this present world. Now, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know if they were just like, Paul, you know, you're, you're just too much of a slave driver. You wake up early. You go soul winning too much. You're like a hyper soul winner. And you, uh, like, all you want to do is, is, is serve the Lord, and I need a little break. And so he went back to the things of this world. I don't know if it was like that, or if he, like, was going after money, filthy lucre, or, or he's very covetous. I don't know. He just says, hey, he's left me. And he says he loves this present world. See, there's that phrase again, this present world. Right now, the world that we live in, right, not, anyway, the world that we live in, that's, that's the world that you, we, there's no way to get out of that, but we don't want to love the things of it. We don't want to uh, be so friendly with the world that we're actually going against God. Does that make sense? Look at James 4. James 4 is a great verse on that. James 4, 4. James 4, 4 says, ye adulterers and adulteresses. Now he's not, I don't believe he's really talking about people that are living in adultery. He's talking about spiritually, like you're supposed to be loyal to God, but you're, you're cheating on him and you're going after the things of this world, right? Because here's what he says, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of this world is the enemy of of God. Now you're saying, well, what? I thought you said that we, you know, we can't like go out of this world. We, we have to work with people who are sinners, people that are worldly, people who, who do things contrary to God's word. And that's very true. We do have to. And just because I'm nice to somebody who's a sinner, I mean, we're all sinners. You understand what I mean? But somebody who's not saved uh, from their, from their sins, just because we have to live in that world, just because we have to hear the language, just because we have to uh, uh, see them doing things and know that they're going places after work that we shouldn't go, places that we shouldn't go to, just because we're we're tolerating that while we're in this world, doesn't mean that we're friends of that. Now that's going to be key in your life growing spiritually because at some point you're going to have to make a decision between God and your friends. It, it, that's just the way that it is. If you had old friends and then you become a Christian, your old friends are going to like try to tempt you to do stuff, try to get you to come back. If they haven't come to, if they haven't, you know, trusted in, in Jesus as well, pref, the, the best thing that could happen is you bring your friends along with you and they follow Christ with you. But when they don't, at some point, you're going to have to make this distinction. You know, am I going to live for the Lord or am I going to keep on being just part of this world and being worldly? Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, here is what the this text that we're re, that we're in in Titus. Here is how this text says that we should stand out from unbelievers of this world and the system of this world and the philosophies of this world. Here's how we stand out. Go back to. Uh, Verse 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, 
we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God, of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. It's really clear what he's saying. He's saying you need to uh, be separate. You need to be a peculiar people, zealous unto good works. You have to be, uh, uh, try, you, you know, you're wanting to purify yourself. God gave him, uh, Christ gave himself for us, and, uh, and now we're going to live, live for him. So number one, we see there in uh, verse 12, number one, it says, In this present world, we should live soberly okay so you're christian living in this present world but you're not going to be of this world uh you want to be you don't want to be worldly and you're in this world to say you got to live soberly now obviously in our modern vernacular the first thing you think about being sober means that you're not drunk or high or or medicated to the point where you you can't uh, think for yourself you can't you're not in control of your own thoughts and emotions and actions and i say well that's true that's definitely something we don't want to be uh, the bible does talk a lot about that and we want to be in control of our mind you know if, if ephesians chapter 6 says be not drunk with wine whereas in excess but be filled with the holy ghost right so we don't want to be given over to these substances that are going to control us we want to be completely in control of our thoughts and our minds and give that you know and give that part of our our body to the lord right our hearts our mind our soul we want to give it to the lord so in this present world we need to be soberly <clears throat> there's another application to being sober when the bible talks about sober similar idea when you're not sober because you're under some kind of substance that substance is controlling you you don't have control of your mind but there's another type of sobriety that the bible talks a lot about it's particularly about the older older people we expect kids are going to be a little silly and goofy at times but older people ought to be sober right now i'm not talking about don't 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 ever have fun christians can have fun all right <laughs> I, I stand by that Christians can be a, a little, uh, you know, silly times in, in moderation, but you got to be in control of your thoughts, right? There are people that are just constantly in play mode. You know what I mean? Like all the, they're just like everywhere they go, play clothes, you know? I don't know. I grew, I, I grew up like if we were going to go to a restaurant, you know, there's, you don't have to get you don't have to wear a tuxedo or something like that but it's like you're gonna dress up a little bit to go to that restaurant just because we're going to public we're going to a nice place we're gonna celebrate whatever and you know a long time ago I feel like that's pretty much how everybody was and then all of a sudden something happened and you'd go and people were like in their pajamas and slippers and kind of like the Walmart you go to Walmart like two o'clock in the morning and and it's some interesting care I mean otherworldly people in Walmart at two o'clock are otherworldly. And, and uh, so anyway, uh, uh, but you know, some people just constantly play mode. Hey, what can I get from like, what kind of enjoyment can I get? What kind of games can I play? How, how silly can I be? And everything's a joke and everything in life, you know, and as Christians, we don't want to be that way. We want to be in control of our minds. We know there's a time to get serious. We know uh, when there's work that needs to be done. Our recreation or entertainment is only for a brief getaway so that we can get recharged and get back to the work and get serious about it. That is a Christian uh, way to be. Okay, The world wants to have fun all the time, wear play clothes, be silly, and, uh, and we, we know that there's a time to get serious and not joke around and play. All right, But then also uh, being aware and conscious of what's going on. That's important for Chris. I remember uh, Brother Stevie preached a message on that one time. How uh, we need to be uh, in control of our of our thoughts and our minds, and and be watching and be waiting. I mean, I, you know, I'm not talking about looking up and and just spending your life thinking, hey, it's like you know, I was always taught Jesus could come at it, he could come back at any time. So you're just looking up like your head's in the clouds or something like that. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. You know, but we should be watching and aware. And God said, hey, there's going to be deceivers. So we should be watching and waiting. Hey, some people are going to try to deceive us with false doctrine. We should be watching and waiting and say, hey, somebody's going to tempt me to sin. Satan's going to throw some things my way. But if I'm watching and I'm alert and I'm sober-minded, 
I might be able to catch those and say, ah, you're not going to trick me. You know what I mean? I'm ready for this because we're watching and we're sober-minded. A Christian should keep a good head on their shoulders. You could put it that way. And they shouldn't be swayed by everything that goes around the verse. Uh, the Bible talks about some people are swayed with every doctrine, every wind of doctrine. Ephesians 4.14, I'll read it. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cutting, cunning craftiness whereby they, wait, they lie and wait to deceive. I think it's so interesting how the Bible talks about wicked people who are like just, man, you could just look at them and the whole world knows that's a wicked person. I mean, just, just filth and vile and, and doing all kinds of, of, of filthy things. But then the Bible talks about a wicked person that in a way is even more wicked than that to me. And that's a person who, you know, whose heart is totally against God, but they pretend to be religious. They pretend good people and they deceive people and they try to bring them over to false doctrine or they, they try to take advantage of them to get their money or whatever and they're using Christianity and they're acting like good people you know, for the wrong reasons. Sometimes I'm like, I would rather just see the person that's just all filthy and vile and, and you know, uh, doesn't, you know, just, you can just walk on to the next, the next door. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can just move on and say, okay, that person has made it clear what kind of person they are. Uh, what is uh, that that phrase? Better the devil that you uh, that you know than the devil that you don't know. <laughs> right. So the idea is that uh, is is good, right? Uh, when I'm the Bible talks about uh, those who creep in unawares, right? I think about this when, when I went running. Uh, yeah, I don't get as nervous about this anymore. But when I first started running on trails, uh, I found out coyotes are pretty freaky <laughs> when they start howling. And it was weird because like the sun would go down and I'd be like racing to beat the sun because I'm like, as soon as that sun goes down, those things start howling and I'm like, they're all around and I'm going to die. And so you pick up the pace a little bit or whatever. But after a while, I realized that's not that threatening. And, and, and not just that, I'm not afraid of like anything that I can see. Does that make sense? I was always afraid of, uh, of uh, hey, they, they, they have mountain lions on the trail. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be another trail I run on, but there's articles out there. I'll share them with you. There are mountain lions in Kansas. But, but anyway, I don't know if they're called mountain lions. What are they called? Uh, cougars or something. Big big cats. All right. I was always wor worried about that. And so I'm looking. If it's getting dark, I'm like with a flashlight looking. But you know what? If you saw a cougar on the trail, you're probably going to survive that. The, co the, the cougar that you never see until it bites your neck, you know, that's the one you need to worry about. You know, because they just, they're, they're being sneaky. They're hiding out. And you don't know when they're going to pounce on you. When they pounce on you, it's too late. And that's why you got to be real careful. You got to be sober minded. You got to be on the, on, on the lookout because you're going to, because some people, are, you know, false teachers are already going to come in this church. And, uh, and we don't want to just, you know, accuse everybody or just see everybody and think, oh, that's a wicked person. But it's going to happen. The Bible makes it clear. I mean, Jesus and the disciples, they had Judas among them, hanging out with them that whole time. And uh, everybody was kind of deceived on that. So anyway, uh, we want to be sober-minded, okay? And then secondly, what does it say? In this present world, we want to live righteously. Righteously. Now, the opposite of righteous would be wicked, right? Doing that which is right versus doing that which uh, is wrong or, or wicked. Other synonyms be uh, upright or just, the Bible talks about. Look real quickly at, at uh, uh, Genesis 6. Genesis chapter 6. We're talking about God's people in the world, but not being worldly. Genesis 6. This is the story of Noah. And he was living in a wicked time. Violence prevailed all over the earth. All kinds of wickedness. And uh, Genesis 6, verse 9 says this, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Now, I'm not saying Noah was without sin. I know it says perfect here, but that's got to mean something else because the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we know we can, we can read the Bible and see the mistakes that Noah made. And so we uh, aren't saying that Noah is without sin. But God looked upon him, and he saw his faith, and he saw his righteousness, and he said, he, this is a righteous and perfect uh, man in his generation. Job 1, same thing. 
Job 1. In Job's generation, he was a perfect godly man. Job chapter 1, verse 1, there was a man in the land of Uz, not Oz, this is a real person, in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. So we're talking about men that were righteous. The men who, they lived in this world, they had an effect on this world, but they were upright people who eschewed evil and they, uh, they rejected the wickedness and they lived righteously. The Bible says in this present world, we should live righteously. When the rest of the world is turning to violence, and look, there's a lot of violence going on in this world, right? When the rest of the world's turned to violence and hate and all these crimes and all this kind of stuff, we ought to stand out as Christians as somebody who is, is, is are, are promoters of peace and love, right? And joy and trying to keep people in harmony. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> there's a time to, it's not in, not in this sermon, but there's a, there is a time to stand up for justice and stand up for right. There's a time to fight. There's a time to defend ourselves. I don't have any problem with defending yourself or especially your family or even defending your country. And there's times where uh, what could be considered violence is just actually justice. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's actually a just thing and a righteous thing. Uh, but us individually, Jesus taught us to be lovers of peace. And if somebody smites us in the face, we turn to the other cheek, right? Because uh, we're not all about like, hey, let's just, uh, you know, that's, that's a radical way to live. That's a radical person that would, you know, not allow the flesh, you know, to cause them to want to fight and to, and to be part of that, that violence. Not want to jump in with the world on the sexual perversion, you know, and, and their, their pride of their, of their sexuality. This world is, this world is nuts, man. <laughs> this world is nuts. Just the other day, I saw for the first time uh, Brother Justin showed me, and then I found out it's this, this thing that's going around. Uh, there's advertisements for our military. For our military. Like, okay, so you want to join the Army, right? I grew up, Army, Marines, all that kind of stuff was, I mean, that's what the boys wanted to play, and they're crawling in the mud, and they're climbing over fences, and they're painting their face and all this kind of stuff, and they're strong, they're doing, put, drop and give me 50, and they jump down and give you 50, and you're thinking, oh, these are just like manly, Men in the military, this, 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 uh, the most recent, you look it up yourself if you don't believe me, most recent advertisement for the Army starts off, first of all, it's a cartoon, right? It kind of gives you that idea, like, what is this? What am I watching, like, uh, Dora the Explorer or something? <laughs> That's the first thing I thought about. Some kind of cartoon, right? And it's like, this is a story about Emma who had two moms, and then the whole thing is like, and it is like just praising the fact that, she, that her two moms stood up for justice and they fought against inequality and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, why are you even bringing that into this? This is about the army. <laughs> this is about defending your country. It's not about, you know, standing up for the rights of, the, of whoever's sexual orientation or whatever. And I'm like, what in the world is this world coming to? And, uh, and you know, just like the next, uh, the next thing I saw, man, I see all kind of weird stuff. I saw Bruce Jenner, who I don't even want to pervert some of the kids' minds on this, okay? But, but you, if you know who he is, Bruce Jenner was tweeting or whatever, making fun of that uh, Levin, whatever. I'm, I'm checking to see if I see nods so you guys know what I'm talking about. Levin, who is like some health uh, inspector or something like that. And uh, both of them are transsexual, okay? And so he tweeted and he made fun of the way he looks or something like that. And next thing you know, all the media is like Bruce Jenner is a transphobe, as, as a tra transphobe, how do they say <laughs> Transphobe, transphobia, something like that. I'm like, <laughs> our world is insane, right? In a time when our world is so insane and so like mixed up, like they don't even, this is science, right? Science, male, female. And they're so mixed up that they can't even tell the difference between that. Don't you think Christians ought to stand out? <laughs> and men, like, hey, that's a manly man. Hey, women, that's a, that's a, well, you couldn't say that. Yes, I can say that. <laughs> but you're going to stand out. Well, good. I want to stand out. 
I'm in this world. I know I'm going to work somewhere where people have those views. I know I'm going to, you know, order my food from some restaurant and somebody's going to give it to me who's probably a sexual pervert. <laughs> I know that's the world that I live in, but I ought to stand up for righteousness and say, well, I'm not part of this world. I'm in this world, but I'm not worldly. You know what I mean? I, I, I go by this, the truth of God's word, and that's what's going to guide me, and that's what's going to, uh, you know, God's the one who's going to judge me in the end. So, so we want to be in this present world sober. In this present world, we want to be righteous. And then it says in our text there that in this present world, we want to be godly. Now, that's pretty close to righteous uh, just as, as you first look at that. But I was thinking about this. You know, all right, I already talked about men should be manly, women should be womanly. Is that even how you say it? <laughs> I guess that's right. Womanly. Beast should be beastly, right? I'm not, uh, anyway, beast. I'm talking about different people and, and they are what they are. You add the L-Y at the end of it, right? Well, people who are born of God, who are spiritually born of God, should be godly. They're children of God. They should be godly. They should look like something that came from God. <laughs> it's interesting, on uh, Soul Winning yesterday, this one guy I talked to, he, he wasn't very, uh, uh, I guess you would say he was, really, he was simple, okay? I could tell probably a lot of drugs and stuff like that, maybe that's part of it. But he came out, house was like falling apart. A lot of houses in that area were, were just falling apart. And, he, and I knocked and I knocked. I think about the third time I knocked, usually the third time, and, I'm, I'm, and that's my last one. I leave something on the door. But about the third time I knocked, he called and said, that door doesn't work. You know, come meet me on the other side. And so I walked around and he came out. And he's kind of simple-minded. And uh, we started talking. He's listening. He's understanding what I'm saying. And uh, he's like, yeah, I want to. He, he didn't know for sure. He said he believed in God, but he didn't know if he was going to heaven. So I said, great. I started talking to him. Uh, you know, it, he said he can't read. So I was like, I'll just read the verses to you. And, uh, but I mean, he was, he, he understood enough. I mean, he was a nice guy. People, people driving by and he's waving to him. He, maybe he was a drug dealer. I don't know, <laughs> but he was, a uh, he, he was, he seemed like a decent, decent guy, but he was simple minded. And, and, uh, and I started going through the gospel with him and I'm like asking him questions to make sure he understood what I was saying and he understood. And then I got to this part where I said, I'm talking about how to receive the gift of God. And I said, you know, John 1, 12 says, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed in his name. And he said, whoa, sons of God? And he said, but there's only one son of God. He talked about Jesus. And I was like, I see what you're saying. There's only one son. And maybe he's thinking like we're some weird, like, you know, I think the, I think the Mormons teach there's you be, uh, sons of God, spiritual, spiritual babies and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, no, 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 let me show you in the Bible. Jesus was called the Son of God, right? Always was the Son of God. He was also called the Son of Man because he was born of woman from Mary. And so he was called the Son of Man and he was called the Son of God. The Bible shows us that Adam was called the Son of God because God just created him. He, he didn't have a mother or a father, right? Now, guess what? When, when we receive Christ, we spiritually are born again and we're sons of God because... It's not a mother and father. God just creates a new life whenever you come to him in faith. And so you're born again. You're spiritually born again. When Jesus said, you must be born again to Nicodemus, he said, well, must I go back into my mother's womb and be born a second time? And he said, no, 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 no. That which is flesh is flesh, but that which is spirit is spirit. He said, you were already born once of flesh. Now you need to be born of the spirit. And when you're born of the spirit, I didn't say all this to the guy, but <laughs> when you're born of the spirit, spiritually born again, you are a child of God, all right? Now, if you're a child of God, you should act like the way God wants you to act, the way God has showed you in His Word, Word, hey, this is how I act. It's kind of like, you know, if I was to say to my boys, now, come on, boys, you're a Randall. Now, act like a Randall, right? Which I don't even know what that means. What do Randalls act like? You act like a Randall. You're part of the Randall family. But I would say, hey, I expect you're carrying on my name. I expect you to, to walk and behave a certain way because you're a reflection of me. Well, if we're going to live for God, He expects us to live for Him. And that's going to cause us to be separated uh, from the world. We ought to be godly. So in conclusion, living differently from the world 
is going to be more about how we dress, what kind of car we drive, whether we use a computer or a typewriter, whether we have a cell phone or, you know, we uh, think that that's the curse of the devil or something like that. Some people, they, I'm getting away from worldly things. And what they mean by that is I'm getting away from technology or whatever. But the Bible is saying that actually what you, uh, when you are uh, staying away from the world's things, what you're talking about, not has to, it doesn't really have to do so much with your dress and all that. Although I do believe Christians ought to look differently even on our appearance. Right? That makes sense. We should look differently in our appearance. The Bible actually does tell us uh, how to, I mean, it doesn't give super detailed specifics, but how to dress, it gives us three different categories. I like to tell people this that are like, how do I know how a Christian is supposed to dress? Well, for the most part, a Christian dresses just like anybody else in the world dresses because, you know, clothes are clothes. <laughs> there's only so much that you can do with clothes. But there's three areas that God does give us, and one is uh actually decency covering our nakedness right and i think it's interesting one of the first stories about that is is adam and eve sewed fig leaves and tried to make an apron right and god this is a great much greater picture than this but and god made them coats right of skins uh, and he correct cor he gave them a covering okay now that represented the covering of jesus through the blood but uh but it's true the bible speaks a lot about keeping covered you know, the guys uh, were fishing, fishing in the boat, and then Jesus came out, and it says that they put their coats on. Peter put his coat on because he was naked. That didn't mean he didn't have any clothes on at all. It just means he didn't have enough clothes to cover himself up. He was showing too much nakedness. And there's a lot in the Bible that talks about covering our nakedness. And then the second uh, area that the Bible talks about when it comes to clothing, uh, uh, modesty. A lot of times people get those two mixed up, modesty and decency. Modesty means that it's not you're not flashy. You're not trying to draw attention to yourself. You're not, you know, saying uh, uh, just flamboyant or whatever, uh, you know. But you're just you're you're just you're modest, okay? Uh, so the Bible talks about modest apparel, and then the third thing is gender specific. The Bible says a man shouldn't wear that which pertains to a woman. A woman shouldn't put on that which pertains to a man. And so you, if you just keep in mind these three things, you say, well, I want to follow God. I want to I want to be separated from the world. And so hey, just don't go around naked. Don't go around, you know, dressing like the wrong gender. It's hard sometimes in the store to find the right kind of clothes. But hey. You know, uh, and I'm not saying you have to dress like, uh, uh, what's that called? Uh, <laughs> I can't think what it's called. What's that old uh, show that people used to watch uh, in there? They were in like the pioneer days. What? Yeah, a little house on the prairie. I'm not saying you have to dress like that, but I will say this. Those clothes are making a comeback. <laughs> a while back in Target, I saw it. Now, Target, now Target not that long ago was getting all this grief over like, uh, like going over there, all their clothing was, they were trying to break the gender neutral lines. Like a, a guy or a girl could wear the same clothes and all this stuff. And uh, it's always been around. Uh, basically it's just guys clothes that women wear. And it's just like, Hey, that's, that's, that's gender, gender neutral. Okay. But, uh, but, but no, all of a sudden target had this line of nice skirts for girls and like this nice, little house in the prairie dresses. And I'm like, what in the world? Now, what are we going to do as, as Christians if all the world starts dressing like little house in the prairie? We're going to have to, man, I got to come out from among them and be, <laughs> I got to wear something worldly. No, I'm just kidding. So, but, it, but I want to throw that out real quick because I do think clothing is important. I do think the way we hair, where our hair is even important. The Bible talks about that. And, uh, and all these things are important, but look at first Peter three. This is specifically directed towards women in this verse, but I think you'll understand uh, my point here. 1 Peter 3, 4. Uh, actually, let's back up. Let's start with verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, uh, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and the wearing of gold and putting on of apparel. Now look, women need to put on apparel. It's not saying like, hey, your clothes aren't important. Your clothes are important, but it's saying that's not what he's con concerned about you adorning yourself with. What he's saying is adorn yourself with, and here's what it says, but let it be 
the hidden man of the heart, in the which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, a great price. So what God's looking for is that you adorn yourself with his righteousness, with his godliness, with his uh, uh, you know, meekness, and, and he wants you to be uh, separated in that way. Okay, so final conclusion here. Look, go back to Titus. What does it look like to be in this present world and not to be worldly? I started with verse 11. Now we'll read verse 1 through 10. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their husbands, that the word of God not be blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters, and to please them well in all things, not answering, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. When you're in the workplace, your boss and all the co-workers ought to say, you know what, that's a good worker. You know, They use the word servant here, but the same principle is that's a servant. He's a good worker. He's a hard worker. He obeys his boss. He does what he told him to do without talking back. And, uh, you know, whenever you're at home, husbands are loving their wives and they're taking care of them and they're, and they're, you know, giving sound speech and they're, uh, you know, they're grave, sober minded, temperance, all that. The women, you know, they're loving their husbands. They're, they're being helpful. They're teaching the young women how to do uh, these things. And, and it's like the world, you, you, take, you take this chapter or first Peter and you take that person and you create that person and you drop that person in the world drop that person in almost any part of this world and they're going to stand. Now they might still wear similar clothing to what the world wears. You know, they might still drive the same type of car. Drive a horse and buggy, right? They might still, for the most part, look a lot like the world. But I guarantee you, if they're living for the Lord and they're walking according to this word, they're going to stand out in this world. And that's what we want to do. We don't want to be weird and stand out for the wrong reasons, but we want to stand out because we're faithful to God when the rest of the world is rejecting Him and going the opposite direction. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. I do pray that You'll help us to, uh, to grow in knowledge of it and understanding of it and that we would uh, strive to please You and to live for You with our lives. We thank You that our salvation is secure through Jesus Christ, uh, but I do pray that You'll help us to walk in holiness and walk worthy of the calling which you've called us to. And I pray you be glorified with the, each individual life in this church as we seek to please you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.